everybody to the Jacob Edwards Library. It's our great pleasure this evening to welcome back Mario Bruno Servion to Salisbury. And um, he's been here on a few occasions previously, and you may remember an exhibit that he did as part of a statewide exhibit. And I, I forget name. Aging Minorities in Massachusetts. Okay. Uh, which was an amazing yeah. uh, project, and he actually managed to include Southbridge in it, which made it all the more relevant and really special for our community. And there may even be people in the audience who were actually featured in that exhibit. Um, so Mario's back this evening, and he is going to do a really interesting uh, portrayal of immigrants and how he has viewed that passage. Mario's been in the United States since 1990. Nine, and <coughs> is here from El Salvador and um, has worked in many exhibits and been promoting actively um, in the last number of years and he has also qualified as with a master's in fine art from Leslie University. So he has been actively working at his craft as a photographer and also as a speaker. And he um, gave a wonderful presentation here a number of years ago, and I'm sorry to say we didn't capture it on video, but this time we're ready. So uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome back Mario Quirles to Salisbury, and please give him a nice warm welcome. Thank you. So um, tonight's presentation is going to be really a relaxed one. I'm going to be showing some slides, I'm going to be saying some things, some very bright things and some maybe not so bright things. Um, and if at the end you have questions, please feel free to ask. Uh, Margaret, could you turn off? Perfect, yes. Oh, okay. Yes. And as they do, like when you get into an airplane, the emergency exits are located. <laughs> the bathrooms are located there. There's water, coffee, and cookies. So after that, we are all set. And a baby. Oh yeah, and a, and a baby is in fact, you've been crying, you know where is that coming from. So tonight's, uh, tonight's uh, presentation is about photography of America's immigrant heritage. And it's like when you get every possible idea and you put it all together in one single title. So when I was preparing the talk, I was like, so I have to talk a little bit about history of photography and a little bit of history of photography related to immigration. I had to talk about a little bit of the immigrant experience. I had to talk a little bit about heritage. And finally, how photography is an ever-present witness of the immigrant heritage or the immigrant experience. So more than 150 years of trial and error of combining photography and advocacy have proved that change can happen. And through all this back and forth in history, there's a, there has always been photographers pushing an agenda. And we're going to talk just a, you know, about a few of them, <coughs> because we only have 58 minutes, 57. Um, <laughs> but at least we're going to try to cover you know, the basics. Um, as a photographer, my practice is rooted in this context in the context of that photography can call on the unfair conditions of, of how the other half lives. And we're going to talk about that concept that came many, like a hundred and something years ago. Um, so my practice aim, aims to use photography to empower immigrants and minority communities to reclaim self-awareness and self-identity. My own immigrant experience is an indispensable component of my work's currency in other words, the fact that, and I'm not, yes, of course I'm talking about myself, but it's not a thing that is exclusive of myself. But every time in any given thing that we have a chance to be reflective about what's happening with us and around us, and then when we have tools to express and to communicate that, then that's when you know, in this case, photography or art becomes an empowerment tool because you are communicating that. My artistic proposal is a threefold working methodology. First, my practice needs to be community based. And as Margaret was saying, when we did the Aging Minorities in Massachusetts project, after I finished photographing, actually the final 
curatorial process was done with some of the subjects in the project. And that's how basically it works. So any project that I do, instead of being me, the photographer, who has all the power on deciding what goes where, it's always the same people that are in the project, that the ones that decide. So the subject in the community should have a direct input and should endorse it wholeheartedly. Second, the work needs to be a call to action. So it's not pretty for the sake of pretty. It has to be something, it has to be about some, something. A few years ago, um, I did a photo project about domestic workers in Massachusetts because they were trying to pass, and eventually pass, a domestic workers' bill of rights for the Commonwealth. And I always say that obviously it did not pass because of the photo project. But I hope that it helped. And I tell you, what was the strategy? So we went, actually, we organized, like in public libraries, exhibitions. And we show it at the libraries where the key like, senators and state reps live. So they were invited to an art exhibition at their local library. And when they were there, you know, it was about the domestic workers below. So you see again how you can mix things and use art, in this case photography, to have a call to action. And finally, the third aspect is archival quality of the work. So you need to be sure that a photograph should last on its own merit after the moment that it's present. And that's a big difference between photojournalism and documentary photography. Because with photojournalism, like we are consuming images every single minute. And the images that impress us today will be forgotten in a week. And just think about all the shocking images that we saw just a few months ago. They're gone. So yes, things that are happening in the present, you know, worth photojournalism can become historical. But working in, that, in a more documentary context, it gives you the time and the peace to work around that. The photographs should be competent in the current artistic discourse, so they can be displayed and preserved in galleries, museum, and official archives. I'm not the first practitioner who has employed photography as a tool for social change. In the early stages of photography, a tenant's right advocate got so frustrated with, with the photographer that he hired, so you know, he was making such a bad, horrible pictures, that he decided to make the photographs himself. And that's how Jacob Rees started his practice. And he is, he is a great grandfather of social documentary photography. Mm. And, and it tells you that you can arrive to specific places coming from many directions. Also, at some point, an adult education, um, adult education professor realized that images were much better to share a point, especially when so many of his students spoke different languages. And that's how Louis Hein picked up the camera. In this talk, we will visit the work of several photographers who have witnessed America throughout the time, throughout time, and how they have reacted and acted about what it meant for them to be immigrants. So now we're gonna get into the section that it's about reclaiming a voice. Because you see how in any given narrative, the people with the lesser voice or the choir voice gets, becomes voiceless. And in conversations or in, in exchanges, this, unfortunately today, the one that yelled the loudest tends to override everybody else. Mm -hmm. But, you know, not because you are the loudest, it means that you are right. They are just basically taking the space. So, a photo practice is about reclaiming that voice. 
The self-defined term of immigrant is relatively new to the American experience. Up to 50 or, or 60 years ago, you were not immigrant, but Irish, Italian, Greek, Polish, or German. Regardless if you have been born in the old country or here in the States. And that's so, I mean, you know, I always find that so interesting because you can be talking with people and, oh, yeah, 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 we're Italians. Oh, yeah. Oh. So, in which part of Italy were you born? No, no, no. You know, my, my great grandparents came from Italy. Uh. Or a lot of people say, oh, we're we are Greek because, you know, they have a Greek heritage food. So, before, there was no otherness about immigrants. Like, everybody was or an immigrant or the children or grandchildren of immigrants. So, again, because always the small, I don't want to say small people in a bad sense, but, you know, the people that cannot be fluent in the discourse get pushed aside. And that's when the labels start. Even today, we talk about that families define themselves by nationality, even if they are third generations. There's a turning moment in American history in which the otherness expands to include immigrants. But, and here's the interesting thing other immigrants, not their own immigrant heritage. You see what I'm saying? So, Everybody, you know, like, oh, our immigrants. Although, you know, my parents came well, some time ago. So it's so interesting how we tend to do the separation between them and us. Um, and just in, you know, in the drive here, we're talking with my wife about that. How so many other cultures don't, like, in our Western culture, we are raised from day one to us and them. Like, and you go, when you go to Sunday school, you know, like, good kids go to heaven, bad kids go to hell. Like, we are wiring this binary division of them and us. And if that, you know, that keeps going and not going and going. So, I think it's time to go to basics, to go back to a rational, politics free approach and to start speaking with a first-person frame of mind, right? Like, it's not them, it's we. And sometimes, unfortunately, it's, well, the times that we're living right now, it's the opposite. I don't know if you have seen this person around. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about us and them and we. Um, we need to understand that today's immigrant experience is connected to all of America's immigrant experience. America's core identity as a nation of immigrants is its legacy and starting point. Taking into account that, so this is how it works. Going back to the, to the idea of learning to have a voice. What makes an artistic practice a two-way street is that you can reach realities. Like, you know how to say things and feel things in your original language, yet you know how to translate that, not only on like word language ones, but like with the entire psyche. And on a very side note, my wife was doing some translations from, I think, English to Spanish. And it's so interesting how in English, you, you are very descriptive to what you do. And the names and things, like, for example, you are, you are sitting in a chair, right? That's, well, that's what you're doing. Then in Spanish would be a very different description of the same action. Um, just my father-in-law is using the thing to, to measure the sugar. And you, you describe that. You know, you're measuring the sugar. But in Spanish, the tool has a name. And the entire experience is 
defined by the name of the tool. So anyway, the point to be is that understanding the different the differences in cultures and connecting them, it's what makes art so fantastic. The commonality of coming from somewhere else expand the approachability with other immigrants communities beyond, you know, in my case, my Salvadoran Spanish speaking background. My Salvadoran Spanish speaking background. I am an American who happens to be an immigrant and an immigrant who happens to be Salvadoran. I did spend time reflecting on this idea because it depends on how you come and go is the approach. So think about when you have a team that is working with you. If everybody has their own toolboxes and everybody has different tools, if you have a problem, so much better to say, we have this problem, what tool do you have? What tool do you have? What tool do you have? So everybody brings different tools and you can fix it right away, right? So that's the power of community and that's the power of expanding you know, or opening our communities. Now, we're going into the next stage, and it's called Photography of the Oppressed. Um, there's a really amazing sociologist from Brazil, uh, Paulo Frey Fer. Ah. Is yes. Um, thank you. So I, I took his idea of, you know, the, there's a the theater of the oppressed. There's, so I was like, okay, what about if we use that concept for photography? And he goes back to the idea of voices. So a socially engaged photographer from within a group of people can put back together all the pieces from her community's shattered identity. She can be like an earthquake's one-person search and recovery team. The first task will be to look for cultural icons that survive. And we all have, from or past, things that we have been saving. And just to use food, because it seems like food is the thing that lasts the most through generations. Like, you know, people don't speak any French but somewhere there's that recipe that comes you know from French Canada and it's somewhere there right so you know if we somehow <coughs> preserve those things at the food level there are many more at the higher level and especially when minority communities always get I don't want to use the word attack, but blame for things, right? And then, uh, oh, you, you should only speak Spanish, oh, you should only speak English, or you should only do this, only do that. And I always find it so interesting that, in going back to the toolbox, the more resources you have, the better. But we are living in the times that we are living, and the key is not too much about complaining, but, you know, the one search earthquake person pulled together things, whatever you can sell it. Second, to rebuild their identity starting with fragmented elements. Finally, her, her greatest task will be to reunify and record all the rescued essentials. Even then, a new and contemporary look sustained on an artistic discourse. Ah, that quote sounds very fast, right? Mm -hmm. yes, I took it from my MFA thesis. But it's very simple. So it's basically what you have to do is make the old make, look new. It's basically. You know, take everything that is there, re-transform it using modern, you know, language, artistic language, and represent. And if you think about 
in art, nothing is ever created, but recreated. And our, like the topics and the subjects comes one way, and then it makes like an entire journey, and it comes back, and it goes again. And, you know, to history, maybe it will be a little bit of, like, with a tint of religion, and then it will be more into science. Think about all the art that came from the, you know, 1910, 1920, <coughs> very industrial, very promising, very, like, the future is coming. So there was hope. And then World War I came, the Great War. And then everybody saw the press, and then, you know, surrealism and Dadaism. And, but after that, people again, spirits, that's lifted. So we're doing this circle. In whose culture has capital, a critical race theory discussion of community cultural wealth, Tara Joseph wrote, and because the quote is really long, I decided it was going to be easier. Just so but what I did is I, you know, put it in a way that it can be read freely. So it's a critical race theory. Shift the research lens away from the deficit view of community of colors as places full of cultural poverty, disadvantages, and instead focus on and learn from the array of cultural knowledge, skills, abilities, and contacts possessed by socially marginalized groups that often go unrecognized and unacknowledged. Right? So stop feeling pity for me. Stop victimizing yourself. Stop saying like, oh, we don't know. Uh, right? And also stop letting people put yourself in within a checkbox. But instead, Look what you have. Look at the wealth that you have. Language, culture, art, and then start from there. Um, my practice is rooted in the idea that of using images to translate economic, political, and human experiences into narratives that announce, denounce, or call for better social conditions. An individual that encompasses the values, traditions, and cultural and political heritage of a community can become proficient in the ways of mainstream cultural and artistic exchanges. Now think about the same way that we are talking about the short term, like this like short span life of the new cycle. Art. It's an incredible short live experience. What was in style last year is totally gone. What was in style? Uh, uh, think about Lady Gaga, <laughs> right? I mean, to give her credit, the only one that has always stayed on top and, you know, in 50 years going. It's Madonna. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and she deserves the credit for that. But there's one out of how many, you know, weekly top charts in the radio. So it's the same principle that it depends on where you put in your practice, or like towards where you put in your practice, or at the service of what is your practice. Because Yes, you can be fashionable for one or two, three years, but then you know you have to come back with something even crazier to top that. But the moment that you are about to make it, there's 200 people behind you that are ready to push you out. So you you know it's it's your decision if you want to be in that game or if you put your artistic practice at the service of something. Therefore, he becomes a bridge, a cultural broker that can translate back and forth between two different realities. 
So we're going to round 10. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, it was a very good bell to switch to number four. The first other who gained a voice. There are some examples of people who understood the power of photography as a tool, a powerful advocacy tool. In 2018, Jacob Reed's work is still emotional and intellectually challenged. His seminal work, How the Other Half Lives, was first published in 1890. Well, that's a lot of time. The opening line to his introduction start with, long ago, it was said that one half of the world does not know how the other half it did not know because it did not care. The half that was on top cared little for the struggles and less for the fate of those who were underneath. So long I was as he was able to hold them there and keep its own seat. Thank you for computer for letting us know that it's a yeah. So I will repeat that. Half, the half that was on top cared little for the struggles and less for the fate of those who were underneath so long as it was able to hold them there and keep its own seat. So Buddha says that we all going to reach you know, the next stage, until the very last of us makes it. And I have always found that so interesting because, you know, going back to the white, like binary wiring that we have, that us and then, good, bad, you know, you're gonna save yourself or you're gonna condemn yourself. It's the same idea, like, we tend to forget that the pain of the others is our pain. But somehow, somewhere, we lost that. And now it's as long the pain of the other doesn't hurt me, I don't care. And it should be different. It should be we are in this together. It's a very simple thing, right? So more than 150 years later, this text still resonates with the 99%, demanding some share of the wealth from the 1%, which is another version of the same story. Now, the professor with a camera. If I had, by the way, if I had, I always joke that if I had like a mythical great grandparent, like, fo like photo, so, Louis Hine will be on my mom's side, and Ansel Adams will be on my dad's side. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he was, Louis Hine was born in Wisconsin in 1874. After graduating as a teacher from the University of Chicago, Hine went to New York and started to impart to teach classes at the New York Ethical Culture School, one of the flagship educational institutions of the progressive movement. What is funny actually talking about the progressive movement and Jacob Rees and so on, I mean, this is just a short talk, right? So we cannot go deeper on all of them, but you know who was his, who was Jacob Rees' greatest ally in changing the Senate condition in New York? Somebody who at the time was the governor of New York and later become, became a US president, Teddy Roosevelt. So, you know, and so it's so interesting when you s think about the reality back then. But also it tells you that it's always about building partnerships because, you know, maybe well, by yourself you are alone, you know, fighting the rain. But if you have two or three more people, you can build something. And not only build it, but move forward. So, 
going back to, to Heinz and the progressive movement, you know, they did a lot of things. They achieved a lot of things. It's too sad that 20, 30 years later, you know, McCarthy came along and they all became the devil. So we barely know them. Most of Heinz students were immigrants and he got to know them on a personal basis. In his time, Hein fought harder and became one of the most important photographers of his generation. Hein's photographs were influential in changing the hearts and minds of the policymakers and public opinion of the early 1900s and helped to push a more progressive social reform. And maybe I'm not showing his, like, his most iconic photographs, but he was so essential to stop child, child labor. You know, before, and we just had to drive to Lawrence or to, you know, Lowell to learn about and see where the little kids will be working like, ch 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 oh, I chopped my hand. Out. Next kid. That men will be paid, I don't know, 10, women will be paid 4, and kids 2 or one. Again, this is such a short talk, but you know how the business, like the immigration business was back then? So, Titanic, right? Like, cha cha, all of that. So that was happening, like, first class, but all the way to the bottom of the ship. There were a lot of companies, so like cruise ships, that will have offices in Ireland and um, England and Germany and Poland and basically they will sell they will sell you the ticket and if you know if you had the money to buy the ticket you were your way to America but not only that a lot of companies especially mining companies you know will pay you, like if you let's say you were in Scotland and you were like a fantastic miner so they will pay you a, to, to bring you and your family, but you had to work with them for 10 years. And then your kids will have to work for them too. So, we tend to romanticize things. And because the talk is about, you know, photography as America's immigrant heritage, you know, it's really important that we remember this. Because, like, this image, if you have, if you ever had gone through like photo books or anything, that is a classic. Do you see how we lost the context? Because we don't know where it's coming from. Or how many hours has he been working? So move it on. So a teenager opposing the cultural south. The next um, historical link is the Bouvet. He is the child of Jamaican parents who grew up in Harlem. His practice demonstrates how since one's community of group of people can awake an artistic reaction. In his 2012 essay, Swatter, he reflects on the need to clarify the differences, the difference in the interpretation of self-perception between mainstream and black culture. The institution of, and I'm quoting him, the institution of slavery, wherein being blacks, when, wherein begins black contact with America, with Americas, deeply encoded a set of relationships designed to eliminate all vestige of black humanity and place the black body in a sub, subservient role of other subject, subject, ugh, subjugation. Those were blacks depicted in visual culture as foot shuffling, watermelon eating, buffoonish caricatures, <clears throat> their very humanity stripped away. While these images filled the public arena, blacks always knew that those images were not theirs. And so the photographic image became important to the visual construction of black humanity. And there's a really really, really famous uh, photographer, and 
uh, Van Ness, I think. He was from Harlem. Like when Harlem had the Harlem Renaissance in the early 1900s. Um, and there was a very affluent African American community. You know, he went out and photographed people, and you can see the aspiration of the community. And in the 60s, or 70s, I believe, the, the New York Museum of, Metropolitan Museum of Art decided to do an exhibition about all of that, you know, about Harlem Renaissance. But the interesting thing is that there was zero black photographers. So it was an exhibition about a you know, flourishing black community, but there was not a single black photographer. And that's what his, his point is. You know, community minorities has been always cornered and described and defined by other groups. And that's where art plays such a big role because it gives a voice. These ideas are one of the many tools that African Americans have been making available to empower their identity. Mm -hmm. And I could have made equally successful references to Karen May Wynn or Latoya Ruby Fraser. And Gordon Parks and so on and so forth. Now let's move to El Barrio. So Joseph Rodriguez is a New York New Yorkan, which is a Puerto Rican that was born in New York, or heavily with Puerto Rican heritage, with an extensive social practice. When you go to his work, you see a community with virtues and shortcomings. There's no judgment, just a reflection of a reality made with multiple layers. In an interview with Ken Light, Rodriguez explained why he can be there. Quote, I have been behind bars. I know what troubles are about. I have had these struggles within my own family. We have been poor, so don't come and ask me what right do you have to do that. I have been there. And I think it's really essential. I mean, the quote is very dramatic, right? Yeah. But it makes a point. It makes a point that We have the right to have a voice. We have the duty to have a voice. And I have a friend, a very dear friend. She's from Connecticut. You know, she always said, I grew up in Connecticut with two moms. Um, so by default, she already grew up different. Like she somehow was in the other side of the other. And her my closest friend is from Peru, and she has been photographing her friend and her family. And she's always afraid of saying like, oh, yeah, but I'm, I'm their friends, but I'm, you know, not really fully one of them. And I are always argue back that if you are in their birthday pictures, if you have a pet name with them within the family, if they know how you eat your breakfast, you're pretty much part of the family. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on your own definition of the others. So <clears throat> in a forward thinking mentality, is what unites us. It's not the language that we grew up with, but the aspirations that we all have. It's a very simple switch of mentality. Like, instead of trying to find differences here, or even better, instead of trying to find differences in our past, it's always better to, fi to find commonality in our future. Right? And so, I always use a really wonderful example. In January 2016, I was invited to have an exhibition at the Williams Gallery at Indiana Wesleyan University, a private conservative Christian church. The main concept was to show my immigrant work from a social justice <coughs> approach. 
and the title was New Impressions, Immigrant in Contemporary America. It's about using the backdoor strategy. Art can open so many more doors. So there you have, you know, there you go. So the, those are the tools. You have something to say. You have a way of saying it. And then you have the wrapping or the the present, you know, to do it. And I always I think I will always treasure that experience because very Christian very like just to give you an idea in their media building department <coughs> so there were two TVs right one was showing Fox News <coughs> and to show the other side of things they had CNN so you know the needle was yet they care so much for people <coughs> and you know they have such a such a wonderful and generous heart that my conclusion was yeah the differences are nose and that's it but the essence you know all the things that my aunt will say like yeah, good person such a sod same thing so yeah we should stop looking on the external differences and go deeper. <coughs> Susie Linfield's explanation of why Robert Capa went to Spain is similar in spirit to my motivations to photograph immigrant life in America. Uh, Robert Capa was like this Indiana Jones of photography. That's probably the best way of describing him. So, Kappa covered the war as an exciting news event, and it was. But he covered it too, and he's talking, um, she's talking about the Spanish Civil War. Because as a Jew, a refugee, a leftist, and a Democrat, he was passionately <coughs> pro-loyalist and passionately anti-fascist. And because he believed that the outcome of the war <coughs> was, a crucial, was of crucial importance far beyond the borders of poor, marginal populous Spain. And I think it really matters for everybody to remember that you know we are I don't know how many hundred miles away from Washington and like at least hundred and oh, like fifty seventy from Boston. Seventy. 70. But we are point zero in South Bridge. So instead of waiting and hoping, you know, that somebody somewhere do something, you know, we can always start what we have here. We can always have healthy conversations. Um, John Stewart once he was interviewing um, Rick. What was his last name? He was a senator from Pennsylvania, <coughs> Santorum. Oh. And, you know, and, and very opposite views. And he started the interview this way. Let's agree. We both love strawberry ice cream. Mm -hmm. You see how, how you can always break that tension. My practice is my podium, my inflammatory speech, my message of peace. My message of enough is enough. I am a witness of my own time. An artistic, uh, an artistic photographic practice can do more than blame. It can gather a set, set of collective experiences and given them a new platform. It can rescue and document, and document all the multiple layers of what it means to be an immigrant. Photography can be a mirror that develops self-awareness. And when you add a sense of past, present, and future, and you help to shape context. Photography can create self-identity. Obviously, this is not a universal, one-size-fits-all approach. It is an individual, personal reading, and interpretation of social change. Right? So, this is what I think. 
this is what I believe. Um, there are some historical examples that somehow say that I'm in the right direction. At the end, you can answer me. So, will you like a show at the MoMA? And I said, absolutely. Would I put all my efforts to show the MoMA? Nah, not really. Because I prefer, you know, an exhibition at public library where you can really talk to people. That you can show your work to people that agree with you, but also show your work to people that disagree with you. And just doing that, it's more helpful, at least in my opinion. Although, you know, having the mama on your resume never hurts. <laughs> never hurts. <laughs> never hurts. Um, finally, and just to use it as a closing quote, um, so Sal Salgado, in his book Migration, wrote, it is a disturbing story because few people uproot themselves by choice. I'll say it very slow. Very few people uproot themselves by choice. Most are compelled to become migrants, refugees, or exiles by force beyond their control, by poverty, repression, or war. They set off with the belongings they can carry, making their way as best as they, as they can, aboard rickety boats, strapped onto trains, squeezed into trucks, or on foot. They travel alone, with families, or in groups. Some, are, some know where they are going, confident that a better life awaits them. Others are just fleeing, relieved to be alive. Many never make. So for those who, act, who come to this day, for those who will struggle once again, travel in a cycle of documented and non-documented, English speaker, not English speakers. For those who, despite all the unimaginable harshness of life, never lose hope. For those willing to drop their last ounce of strength in order to provide for their children. For them, my camera is their speech, their vote, and their state. My boys sing along with theirs. And just to finish with a yay, happy note, <laughs> um, I'm going to share you know, the project that I've been working this year.
We are grateful to our moms and dads. The same way your folks are grateful to the parents or grandparents. And to us, Goya means as much as Capel, Progreso, Gonzalez, or the Molas means to your family. We are bound forward. We are teenagers after all. So if you have questions, more than happy. Yes. Yeah, I learned Spanish and I found that that opened a whole new door for me to understand uh, the language because uh, you said that you, a lot of things can't be translated directly from one thing to the other. And I understand the culture better speaking Spanish. Yeah. And I was lucky enough to work at a factory where they, I asked them to teach me Spanish and they did. And uh, it was a very, it opened a lot of doors for me. I learned a lot about the culture, and I learned a lot about people I call invisible that I work with that are hardworking people that put their kid through college. And they don't, they're invisible, as I say, because they're not the ones that are dealing drugs yeah. and getting into crime. Those are the people that we see all the time. The people I work with don't exist, are invisible. Yeah. What it's interesting is that, so my mom lives in Richmond, Virginia, and you know, I always wonder how she managed. You know, her, her English is very limited, yet somehow she, she managed to communicate. But also, I can see when, she, when she's frustrated that she wants to explain more. Like, she has a lot of things to say, you know, but the language is a barrier. And then, you know, you want to say, and at the end, so, most definitely, I mean, breaking the language barrier, both ways, makes it easier. Um, and as a, as a nation, as a community, it's just a practical thing. I mean, when you think about that, almost every single major developed country, people speak at least, at least, two languages. We are very, here to stay, sorry to say it, but very parochial in that sense. Because, you know, yes, the country is so big that you can drive for hours, days, and you're still just changing zip codes. But there's more, you know, there's more. So, I don't know if you saw, well, Ken Burns did a, what's it? Somebody else. But it was a PBS, like special about the Great War. And it's so interesting that in that time, like basically they made everybody erase their identity, like national identity. So that's when they draw, you know, yes, I'm published, or, yes, I'm this, yes, I'm that. Um, did you know that, and this is my favorite example ever, do you know that football, not like American football, but like the original football, start here in the state way before any other organized sports. But it was played by commu communities. So it was Italians against Irish, against Germans. And, you know, the kids were, were not interested in being German. They were not interested in being Italians. Think about how they're still in baseball, some elements that are nationality related. Um, yes, so breaking cultural differences is a very good step. More questions? Am I that good? <laughs> <laughs> I think it was interesting the way you talked about uh, being a witness and having responsibility with your camera. And that's my interpretation. And I think that's really interesting how photography can have such a lasting value. You know, you see something and it can have a profound effect on you and you never unforget it. Yep. You, know, like you never can forget it, I should say. And I just think that's really interesting that um, these great photo documentarians have left us such a legacy and it continues. And there's so much nowadays to, to see, I mean, it's, it's, 
you need to take a breath before you go on Instagram or something like that <laughs> because there's just so much to see. But still, even with good, great, brilliant photographs, there's still memories being made and no matter what, and I think that's just really fantastic that we have that art to take with us and it tells a story and it goes across all cultural barriers or language barriers or you know, it can introduce you and give you empathy on something that you might not really otherwise be able to explain. So photo photography is really a, an amazing artistic medium. And it's interesting the time that we're living because you need Instagram in the sense, you know, to be the current artistic discourse. Like you have to be present on what's happening. Because, you know, if I were still showing prints only, you know, it's very limited to the number of people that can look at a print. But on social media, and it's there. Just get a catchy hashtag. You're done. Mm -hmm. But you need to be sure that the content of your image can overlast like the two hours of Instagram. Um, and just to show you, Louis Hines, this image. It, you will always see this photograph in any photo-related textbook. So he was able to hide under a wonderfully composed, dramatic image, a message, that can be coded throughout history. So that's the key on, on this. I mean, I'm sure he will have a lot of likes on Instagram with this photograph. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the photograph has the time <coughs> to go beyond the two hours of his life, like span life of Instagram. And yeah, we we have more access to resources more than ever. The problem is that there's so much of it. So we are getting, you know, overflow consuming, consuming images. That's where the curator, you know, the curatorial part comes and so on, and it's more of, of, of a thing of practice, but yes. There is that as yes. Yeah, I was thinking of back in the 40s, 50s, when there were magazines like Saturday Evening Post and Life and Look, where most of us got it delivered, and there was photos in there that we all saw. So there was a commonality. Uh, and so when you had uh, Rockwell with the famous photo of the little uh, African-American girl walking to integrate a school and the tomatoes being thrown on the wall behind her, the number of people who saw that was larger than anything I think that we have now. You know, you had to wait a week for it to come out, but yeah. people talked about it. Yeah. And they, uh, and we're so separated now. So the challenge is how can you create lasting conversations in a time where everything lasts five minutes? It's a challenge. Um, a little bit, it's repetition. Not repetition, but you know how, for example, in classical music, it's like, it's the same movement that goes back and forth and back and forth, and then you change the time and so on and so forth, but dun, 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 and it goes dun, 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 like for two hours. But, you know, the point is that the average hitting same intention, just a little bit changing the time or the tone and like, so the more we put out the message and create different forms to deliver, mm -hmm. it's, it's a secret. Mm -hmm. um, just the exhibition that we had here, it was focused on 
aging minorities. So it was very human. Like there was no catch behind. Like we all start as a baby, then we become children, then they're teens, and then grown up, and then all the way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we get wiser. <laughs> um, so that is a common experience. And think about when like you make it all the way to 90 or 100, how little you care about the other. You're so glad to be there. And whoever is next to you, you are so glad for them to be there. So, I guess as we get older, we learn to dislearn, you know, to, to forget everything that has been drilling to our brains. So that exhibition was about, you know, this so common, natural thing. And you know, that, that practice can work. My daughter is a photographer. She always says that photography captures the stillness of what reality is. Yep. Because it's always a fleeting moment. Yep. This is an image of a reality that existed many years ago. And if we don't see that, that image, we would know that this gentleman would have been doing what he was doing. So another way is actually photography. It's is to make the ordinary extraordinary. Because I don't think Ford build their cars like this way anymore, right? So machines and computers. But this was probably he did that 800 times in one single day. Yet we are amazed at that. Um, And we all, the same way that we live, or our day has 24 hours, and our week has seven, seven days, and the month has 30 days, and the year has 365, oh, or 12 months. Yet we have those wonderful memories that basically is what make us. And most of the time, they just happen on no special occasion. Yet they were meaningful. So that's what photography is about. You know, to capture the meaningfulness of the everyday. No questions? Yes? Can I just share w with your audience, because they were obviously interested in art, that the Art Center down the street at 111 Main has an exhibit right now for the next couple of weeks by Francisco Rivera Moreiro. I may have slaughtered the name. But the exhibit is from Puerto Rico to Southbridge. Beautiful paintings, prints, little prints, big prints. Um, but the interesting thing is, is he's traced a history of Puerto Rico from the beginning, the different slavery and, and you know, natives and, and colonization and how that has affected the country, the people, the coloring. It's just a fascinating exhibit. And if you go tomorrow afternoon, I'm in the one gallery sitting. <laughs> um, thank you for sharing that. And again, you see, the more people are doing it, the more people telling the stories with different tools, the more chances for a message to get her. I'd like to thank you very much, Mario, for coming this evening and presenting to us, um, especially as we are honoring and celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month here in Southbridge, which is near and dear to us. And um, thank you for being part of that story, and I hope our paths will cross again. Thank, thank you, you very so much. much. Thank you.